Hello, everyone. Very nice to see you all here. I apologize for my voice, but what happens in Hong Kong stays in Hong Kong. And I'm glad because when I proposed this presentation, my intent was to um, make sure we had the opportunity to talk about something very interesting that happened in the last release cycle, which is the collaboration of two projects. But as much as I would have liked to, I was not very instrumental in uh, this, um, uh, the actual development uh, of this. So I have asked Owen and Julien uh, to do the presentation because they were the guy instrumental in doing this collaboration. So I am myself, Nick Barset. I work for Innovance, um, been more involved in the OpenStack project for quite a while. Not as much as I would like to anymore because of conflicts, <laughs> let's say it like that. Um, but the company Innovance is still very much involved, as you certainly know. Uh, Julien uh, works with us. He is uh, one of our uh, lead developers. Uh, he's now the PTL of Silometer. Um, he's been working uh, on OpenStack since the beginning. He is a long-time Python developer. Uh, and Owen, whom is uh, working for Red Hat, is a principal software engineer over there. Been involved on OpenStack for the past two years. Is that correct, Owen? Yep. Um, anyway, let's go to the meat of this presentation. So at the beginning, we had two projects who had only one thing in common. That thing was the, the fact that they've been incubated and integrated at the same time in OpenStack. So it's, one could say they are twin projects, but one was taking care of measuring what's happening in OpenStack, and the other one was taking care of orchestration. One is a template-driven orchestration mechanism, which is meant to automate deployments. The other one is something that is lying underneath that is collecting information so that you can eventually bill, you can eventually uh, do uh, analysis on what's happening in your cloud, you can do quite a bit of stuff with Silometer. But yeah, one was on top, one was on the bottom. So on the surface, these two projects are really not much in common. When you look at Silometer, in fact, what we built with Silometer is uh, a collection engine, a transformation engine, a publishing engine that stores information in various databases and aggregate them. We try to collect from all OpenStack components with a growing number of uh, available meters. And this is what OpenStack measurement uh, should be. This is what Silometer is about. And Owen came up with that great idea that I'll let him express. Please, Owen, join me on the stage. Cool. Thanks, Nick. Uh, yep. <clears throat> um, basically, Silometer provides this workflow whereby we acquire data we basically bring it through uh, a sequence of transformations. We then publish the data via various different conduits. Our primary conduit is AMQP, but we also have a configurable mechanism so that the data can be, for example, in a loss tolerance situation, be published over UDP instead. Um, we then store the data in uh, with a variety of different pluggable storage drivers for MongoDB, for SQL Alchemy, so you can use um, MySQL or Postgres, for HBase, for DB2. And we also provide a API service that provides an aggregation view over these data. So you can go in and say, over a particular time window, um, give me this particular uh, data sliced and diced in, in, in various different ways. Right? So that's what, oh, that's what Solometer is all about. It seems like a, a, a very low-level thing compared to heat. And I'll, I'll, I'll describe the basic workflow in heat next. But as it turns out, this method of acquiring metering data and, and pulling it through the pipeline, storing it, and then making it available for aggregation via an API 
it turns out that's exactly what he needed in order to drive auto scaling, as we shall see. But let's just step back a second, and for people who aren't so familiar with heat, I'll just describe the, the very basics. Now, I actually deliberately made the font there so small that even the most eagle-eyed amongst you are going to struggle. You know, I see a few people squinting. Don't worry about the details there, right? The point is the conceptual understanding of what a template is about. So heat is about a declarative mechanism for standing up your application stacks, describing the resources that you need, how those resources are interrelated to each other, right, and doing all of that via a template. Yeah? So the type of things you describe in a template would be what resources you need. Okay, so I need yay mini instances, volumes, uh, network elements like floating IPs, load balancers, all that sort of goodness, right? Then you describe how all of the resources are interdependent on each other. So for example, you might have an instance, you might have a volume of block storage, and in order for the volume to be made available for use within the instance, it's got to be attached to the instance with a particular uh, device path and so on, right? Then you also, in general, need some form of customization, some way of sort of saying, uh, for the current orchestration workflow, um, I want these particular values to be used. And those values might be things that are just inherently variable, like the size of a volume. Today I want it to be one gigabyte, tomorrow I want it to be five gigabytes, right? Or the flavor of instances that you create. Today I might want to spin up tiny instances, tomorrow I might want to spin up extra large, yeah? So those type of things can be parameterized. You also have a situation where Sometimes you've got kind of sensitive information that you're going to be um, using during the orchestration workflow. Things like passwords and keys and so on, uh, pre-signed URLs, that type of thing. And those are all injected into the template via parameters because these templates end up in GitHub and you don't want to encode sensitive information in them. And then lastly, you've got some kind of outputs generally from the orchestration workflow. Things that you can't predict in advance like uh, say you're allocating some floating IP, what the actual IP address is, right? So that, that's basically what you're talking about in a template. What you want in terms of resources, how they all mesh together, and how you want to kind of specialize this individual, um, this individual workflow execution. So once you've got all that crafted up in the template, the next step is for that to be sucked into the heat engine. So the heat engine consumes the template description, and it does all of the kind of goodness that you'd expect. It verifies it for correctness, it builds a directed um, acyclic graph describing all of the resources that are required and how they depend on each other. And then it walks the graph in a particular way, firing off tasks to create each of the resources, doing things in parallel when that's possible, but also taking care to impose the correct ordering constraints. Yeah? Then when it finishes, after interacting with the public APIs of the various different OpenStack services. It talks to Nova to spin up instances, talks to Cinder to create um, block storage volumes, talks to Neutron to allocate floating IPs, all of, all of what you'd expect, all through the public API. You end up with your complex application stack stood up exactly as you need it. You've got instances, volumes, the instances are placed behind the load balancer, keys are injected, met, user metadata is injected in the, in the correct way. And that's basically what he gives you, a you know, declarative way of doing these things that you could do manually, but obviously you want it to be repeatable, you want it to be customizable, you want to capture this in a well-defined way, and that's what, what, what he templates provide you with. So that's all good, that's fine, but Sizing these things can be hard, right? Deciding how many instances you need to meet the load because predicting the actual level of load and the patterns of variability in that load can be hard, yeah? So sometimes these kind of patterns are very predictable. You know, you got your, your, your well understood seasonal variations in demand that a, that a retail website might have, yeah? Like lots of people buying stuff on cyber, whenever it is, Cyber Monday, Black Friday, those kind of days, right? You get weekly spikes, you know, uh, you, get, you get daily spikes where at certain times of the day there's a lot more activity. But, you know, beyond those kind of very predictable changes in load, there are quite unpredictable and unexpected spikes in demand or troughs in demand. And you want to be able to react in this way in, in, to these variances in, in your demand level 
in an automated fashion that doesn't require any human intervention. And that's what auto scaling is all about. It's about automating the scale out and the scale back of the instances within your application stack to react to dynamic load conditions, right? So when the heat guys approached auto scaling first, Salometer, you know, was kind of like, it was the early days for Salometer, it was the early days for heat, and they needed something that would work, something rudimentary, and this is what they did, right? So this is the kind of version 1.0. So basically, very simple idea, within each instance that, that heat spins up, there's a, a little um, Python script called CFN push stats, and that's generally installed via cron to be run in a scheduled fashion every minute or whatever it is. And that basically uses the PSUtils package to find out stuff like uh, memutil, uh, CPU util, that kind of, those, those kind of basic stats to do with the, the current instance, and then it reports it up to uh, what I call uh, CloudWatch Lite, kind of really rudimentary cut down version of the CloudWatch API, right? Then Heat basically persists these data and then runs periodic jobs to check to see if the sequence of metric data points that have been reported by this, by this Python script within each instance um, have crossed some threshold that's been defined. And if so, it goes and scales out the stack, yeah? Creates more instances. And the, the rate of scale out and the parameters around sanity checking, you know, and ensure you don't trash and that kind of thing, that's all nicely definable, right? So, Basically, you go from a small stack to a bigger stack and back to a smaller stack as load conditions change over time. It's a very simple concept. Now, the thing is, though, and don't get me wrong, this stuff all works, right? The version 1.0 worked, it was solid, but it had a number of kind of, or it imposed a number of kind of undesirable requirements on heat that the heat guys were fairly eager to free themselves from, right? Let me just describe a few of these disadvantages that, that were perceived around this version 1.0 of you know, this, this rudimentary internal implementation of statistics gathering and alarm evaluation within HEAT itself. So first off, if you return to this picture here, you notice that the, we've got a requirement on the actual image that's used to boot up the instance. We require that this particular little Python script is available and that a cron job has been installed to run it in a periodic fashion, right? So obviously anything that makes the images that he can use to boot up instances less generic is badness, right? We wanna keep these things as generic as possible, right? Then we've got the call up to CloudWatch Lite. Now that's done using the Boto client for CloudWatch, and that requires um, a key pair is injected into the instance so that the uh, Python script has the correct level of privilege in order to invoke on that API, right? Now that's generally something you wanna avoid, leaking privilege to an in-guest agent, right? So again, that's kind of, hmm, making people nervous, right? The next thing is the actual periodic um, evaluation of the metric data points to check if they've crossed the threshold. Now that's done within the heat engine, right? And the heat engine basically, <clears throat> current, like there's, there's a, a lot of interest in scaling out the heat engine horizontally, right? Now, if you have a periodic task within one of these heat engines, right, you basically, it, it, it militates against this kind of scale out because then you have to have coordination between the scaled out heat engines so that this one knows that it has to take care of some subset of the alarms and this other guy is taking care of a disjoint subset but all of the alarms are covered somehow even though the, the, you know, the, the population of heat engine replicas is changing as you scale it out and scale it back again, right? So that's another reason they didn't like it. And then the last thing that, that was kind of undesirable about this is that heat was storing the actual metric data itself in its local database, right? Now, metric data can, by its very nature, can be quite high volume. And the heat database was not designed, you know, it's, it's not like kind of, MongoDB or anything, it was intended as a kind of more traditional OpenStack style of database, relatively reasonably um, small uh, data volumes. So obviously storing a lot of uh, metric data there and having to take care of expiry and all of those things, yeah. It just wasn't the area that the heat guys wanted to be involved in. It's not kind of a 
one of their core concerns, right? So they're very eager for this to be kind of taken off their plate. Now, salometer to the rescue. It turns out that this non-core concern for heat is exactly core to what salometer is all about, right? And as it happens, we're already doing a bunch of the stuff that heat needed. We're already gathering uh, most of the relevant stats, and we're gathering in a way that's much more convenient. Instead of doing it from the inside out, as in a script that runs within the guest and reports up to a CloudWatch API, we were doing it from the outside in with an agent that runs on the Nova compute node and then talks to the local hypervisor, talks to the libvirt daemon, for example, and extracts this information. So you have nothing in the guest, right? No need for a special script to be in, um, installed, no need for the key pair to be injected. Um, we also had a, have an API service, and that API service exposes uh, aggregation functionality over statistics so that you can basically say over a particular time window, um, give me the average for this particular statistic sliced and diced in this particular way, right? So a lot of our work was already done in terms of um, rebasing the auto-scaling functionality in Solometer, and that's always nice when, when, when there's a good start already in place. So what do we need to do to actually make this work? What, what, what new elements did we need to add? Well, we needed to define a, a new API exposing alarm lifecycle, right? So your basic CRUD operations, and also alarm history. So you kind of have a, an audit trail, and you can see state transitions over time. We uh, wrote new services, A, to evaluate alarms. So that's kind of the equivalent of the periodic task that was previously done within the heat engine, right? So we do this in a way that's kind of horizontally scalable. So you can have a single alarm evaluator service, or you can have a set of partitioned alarm evaluators that divide the work amongst themselves. And we have a, a coordination protocol for that. And then we have another service that basically handles the feedback loop back to heat, right? A notifier service that basically calls out to a pre-signed webhook, just a URL basically, just as a post on a URL, with a little fragment of JSON saying, yeah, we had a state transition. We've gone from the OK state to the alarm state. Um, because so many points, data points were above the threshold, and here are the most recent data points. Yeah? So all very simple, um, and the, the beauty of it, I guess, is that most of the hard work was already done, right? The data acquisition, the massaging of this data from uh, you know, complex to, uh, to samples that can be uh, easily aggregated over, that was already in place as, as a natural part of the Solometer workflow. So how does it all hang together? Well, let's return to that template file. Even smaller now, so you definitely can't read it, right? Um, basically, a few extra elements needed to, need to be added to the template in order to enable auto-scaling. First off, you need alarm definitions. And these alarms basically bound are what we consider to be the busyness or idleness of our application stack, right? So usually you define it around something like CPU utilization. Yeah, you'd be talking about if the average CPU utilization across my current set of instances is more than 75%, I consider them running hot, right? And in that case, I want to spin up new instances to share this load, yeah? You also have a kind of a low watermark alarm that would say, basically capture the thought, something like, if the CPU utilization averaged again across my uh, auto-scaling group is, say, less than 20%, I consider myself the application stack to be overscaled in that case. Yeah? They're kind of running idle. I could do with fewer of them, so I want to scale it back. Yeah? Then you have to have some conception of the membership of an auto-scaling group. And that's done via user metadata. Yeah? So as you're probably aware, when you spin up an instance in, in Nova, you can associate user metadata with it. And we've got a namespacing convention that allows Heat to kind of tag all of the instances that are in a particular auto-scaling group in a way that's recognizable to Solometer. And then we need actions that basically provide the kind of the feedback conduit so that Solometer can kind of feed back this, this triggering information back into heat. And these are taken in the form of pre-signed URLs, right? Um, and then we need some policies that basically control the rate of scale up, yeah? Do we want to scale up uh, in jumps of a single instance, or do we want the size of the current pool of instances to be increased by 20% or to be decreased by 20%, yeah? 
So it can be an incremental um, delta, it can be a percentage delta, or it can in fact be an exact number. You can say, if the high CPU alarm fires, jump straight up to 10 instances. If the low CPU alarm fires, jump straight back down to two instances. Yep, so it's, it's quite flexible. And then there's some kind of sanity checking built into it as well, this concept of a cooldown period, which is a number of seconds for which the uh, alarm state has got to persist before um, the, any scaling actions actually occur. And that's to protect your um, resource allocation against trashing if the actual level is running very close to the alarm threshold. Yeah? You don't want to just creep over the alarm threshold, scale up, go back down again, scale down, creep up, scale up, and you're just constantly trashing. And when, when you do scale back, it's the oldest instance that's deleted. And, you know, so you're just constantly uh, adding and subtracting. And the cooldown period allows you to kind of smooth out that jitter if you're in the unfortunate situation that your actual load is very close to your, your threshold. So here's a piece of <clears throat> just an example. Um, I didn't want to put up too much of this template language in the presentation uh, because it's really the, ca the concept that's important here. And Heat actually supports several different versions of its DSL. So this is in the kind of the JSON AWS style, but it also has a kind of a YAML uh, heat specific form, and the two are completely equivalent, you know? So in fact, um, converting between them is, is very trivial. So here I've got the definition of an alarm that's bounding a busyness condition, right? So when the idea is when this alarm fires, we consider ourselves to be underscaled, and we want to go up in terms of the number of instances that are allocated. So we give it a name. The type is OS metering alarm. That basically says this is a salometer alarm as opposed to a native uh, heat alarm. Then the type of information we, we need to specify would be the meter name, right? So in this case, it's CPU util. That's just uh, CPU utilization, uh, a threshold, right? And a kind of a time window over the recent past over which to evaluate. And in this case, we say five evaluation periods, each of 60 seconds in length. So that's five minutes in effect. The statistic to apply, so that could be min, max, sample count, sum, average. Average is what we're mostly interested in when it comes to auto scaling. Comparison operator, greater than, less than, equal to, and so on. In this case, it's greater than. And then what you want to specify is an action to take when the alarm fires. And in this case, it's a scale up policy. Yeah? And that policy, the my web server, um, or sorry, scale up policy in this particular case would describe things like the adjustment step size and the cooldown period and so on. And then lastly, that matching metadata. That's kind of a strange one. That's the tag, basically, that Heat uses to represent membership of the autoscaling group. So all of the instances that are spun up as part of this group will have that user metadata set on them. OK, so how it all hangs together. So now, what's different about the mechanism that's used? Well, first off, when the heat engine spins up the stack, there's no need for this push, uh, CFN push stats business. There's no need for the uh, key pair to be injected. That all goes away, okay? All we need to do is ensure that some user metadata is set on the instance. Then basically the heat engine goes and creates the alarms that bound the kind of high watermark and low watermark. It does it via the public um, salometer RESTful API that allows you to control an um, alarm lifecycle. That's basically interpreted by the Salometer API service. And the Salometer also has a, on each of the Nova compute nodes, it's got a compute agent that talks to the local hypervisor and basically um, extracts information equivalent to what the CFN push that script used to do within the instance itself. We also have our alarm evaluator. Our alarm evaluator can be scaled up in various different ways. You can have a single one, or you can have you know, multiple instances of the service dividing the load amongst themselves. But in any case, the basic work pattern is, is very simple. It's talk to the API service, get the statistics over the configured time window, and figure out whether you've crossed the threshold or not. In the case where the threshold has been crossed, the webhook is called out to, that pre-signed URL, and he goes, aha, lovely, time for me to scale out the stack, okay? And the extra instances that are created have the same user metadata set on them, and that's what basically represents their group membership, yeah? So you get the, the scale-up effect as before. 
So basically then drilling down a bit into the, the salometer box, we see that basically we've got a number of interactions between the actual components that, that make up the salometer pipeline. And these interactions are totally central and you know, core to salometer's mission. Whereas when this same kind of interaction was happening within heat, it was basically something that was yeah, not really core to their mission and not really what they wanted to be involved in. Yeah? So basically, the, the, the mechanism that we use to evaluate alarms is this kind of arm's length idea. Right? So you've got your alarm evaluator service that effectively calls out to the API service to, well, first off, it needs to grab the alarm definitions. So those rules that we saw in an earlier slide, um, this one here. So basically, all of that information describing the threshold, the duration of the evaluation window, the statistic, the comparison operator, all of that information is made available to the alarm evaluator via the API service. Okay. So once the alarm rules for the currently assigned set of alarms to a particular evaluator instance are retrieved, the next thing it needs to do is go to the statistics API for each of the alarms, basically get the aggregated statistics over that time period that's being configured in the, in the alarm rule, and then basically determine whether the threshold has been crossed or not. When the threshold has been crossed, what happens is the alarm evaluator emits an RPC message right, over AMQP to another service, which I, I didn't clutter the diagram with it, but that other service is at the alarm notifier. And that's responsible for doing the actual notification, calling out on the, on the pre-signed URL in effect, constructing the little fragment of JSON that I spoke about earlier that heat receives describing why the, the alarm actually fired. And uh, it calls out to, to um, the autoscaling API, and the autoscaling API then takes care of applying things like the cool down period and so on. Now, in order to simplify life for heat, we uh, actually continually notify heat on every evaluation cycle as long as the alarm state persists. And that simplifies their implementation of that cool down period. So we provide the initial, hey, we've just gone into alarm. And then a minute later, hey, we're still in alarm. A minute later, yep, we're still in alarm. And then eventually, so many of these repeated notifications are received, the cool down period expires, and then the actual auto scaling logic kicks in. So we've made life as easy as possible for heat, and the, the old implementation still exists. Um, it's kind of, I suppose, deprecated at this stage, and you know, eventually we'll be able to remove it completely. And we've taken a lot of kind of non-relevant stuff out of the mix as far as heat is concerned. Okay, so I'm going to hand you over to uh, Julien. So. <coughs> It sounds simple when you explain um, <laughs> Owen, but uh, it's, it's kind of a huge piece of work that we did during only one cycle. And this is something I want to emphasize is that we did this, uh, which is something that is, I mean, it involves two projects. Uh, and it had something that worked already. And it's, it's not like they needed us uh, at first sight, but we did something in one cycle, which is bringing uh, the two different projects uh, working together to improve the whole stack. So it's, it's kind of a huge um, achievement, I guess. And well, I'm, I was just the PTL of Cinemator during this cycle, and I just had to follow Blueprint. So I didn't write any of this, and I don't know it as well as Owen, but this is exactly what it explained to us as a Cinemator developer. Uh, six months ago. So, and this is why we were able to do this uh, so fast. As well, because when we decided to help the eat guys and to bring them this feature they needed, um, we are lucky enough to, to have uh, at least two developers who are part both of eat and Cinometer. So that eases things a lot. Uh, they came to us. I mean, Owen came and booked uh, a few sessions during the, the summit in Portland and explained exactly this to us. This is what we need, and this is how we're going to build it. So we just had to listen and to, I mean, we trusted him in terms of code and architecture and things like that, and we, all of us, validated it, 
And it was very easy then during the development process to see patches going through and just reading the code was just nitpicking about Python stuff. We didn't have to ask ourselves, like, is it a good architecture or is it something we really want? We knew we wanted it. We knew how it was supposed to be done from the beginning because we had a good pro communication between uh, our project and between both projects. I mean, we really had a very good understanding of things. So I think it, it comes down to communication between well, the OpenStack project and between our own project. And I'm pretty proud of what we did in, in only one cycle. If I, if I may add, what's really interesting uh, here is that the, the, the end result, alarming that serves EAT, can also be seen as just alarming. Who doesn't need to have some kind of cloud watch to do alarming? And one thing that, another thing that happened that we didn't put in the slide is that Innovance had a customer, everybody knows them, I think, by now, they're called CloudWatch, that had this need to do uh, alarming, just alarming, not for heat yet, but for other purposes. And these two needs, the heat uh, needs and the, the, our customer need, suddenly matched. And then we were able to spread the work against two separate teams that jointly worked on delivering the yes. feature. This is because we built things uh, in OpenStack in general, I think in a generic way. We, we knew it was used mainly for it, but we didn't build only for it. So like Nick said, we can use it uh, standalone. So that's really great. So now that we know it works, uh, we can talk about what we're going to do in, I think, in this cycle for most of this. Uh, it's not going as, to be as big as what we did because we have something pretty basic but it still has a lot of features, but working, and we're going to add a, a few items uh, to it, like uh, adding more metrics, but we can do that in Cinemeter anyway. So it's not particularly tied to the alarming part. Um, it also doesn't support yet the uh, combined metrics we implemented late in the cycle, but with it, um, I guess it didn't have enough time to, to implement it. So we also use a pretty simple um, statistics um, analysis. Um, we'd like to improve it, uh, for example, excluding data points for our low quality and um, out of the trend. We're going to work with the, with the Ionic project. Uh, we had a session a few days ago about this. Uh, we're going to work with these guys. So this is going also, I think, uh, a good inter project experimentation, because we are going to uh, implement things they want us to do. We're going to leverage this in our learning in the same way. We also discussed the um, constraint for alarms with charm of days. Uh, I don't know if we're going on this road or not. It will be discussed, I think, during this cycle, but it's something that comes up sometimes, so it might be useful. Um, we are using currently a pretty simple security scheme for webhooks. Uh, we'd like to improve it to, to use also the uh, EC2 uh, signature on this. So if you've got a question, I think we're happy to answer any. There's one question, two questions over there. Um, over there. Yeah, I'll, 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 maybe I'll take the just just the different resources. So basically, auto scaling and heat is is very in, instance centric, yeah. right? So it's all about scaling up instances. But one of the things that the heat guys want to do in the next development cycle is to kind of make the auto scaling aspect a bit more general purpose, so that basically you can your it's decoupled slightly from your use of heat templates, and you can you can effectively use it to scale up any type of resource, if I understand correctly. So you can kind of add extra volumes, not just add extra instances. You can you know, maybe add extra things that are running database as a service endpoints or whatever it is, yeah. So there's definitely, I don't fully, I'm not fully cognizant about exactly what they're planning to do, but there's definitely a, an appetite within the heat project to make this mechanism just a bit more generic and a bit less dependent on your use of templates. Now, it might be a template actually underneath the hood, 
but it wouldn't be visible to the user. It would be kind of like a default template that's generated that just wraps a single resource. Yeah. There was another question. Yes. So the, the, API, the API was extended to support writing from anywhere to Xilometer. So you can now inject values from anywhere you want. And the way it is done is these values will be constrained to the uh, tenant environment so that you can't uh, leak uh, into the billable information, which would be horrible. <laughs> so, and just to extend, I mean, there are other cases as well where, you know, the, the idea of having a compute agent that's sitting on the compute node talking to the local libvirt daemon, that's a little bit kind of libvirt specific in a sense, even though in the code it's, it's actually quite generic and it's extensible so that we can have multiple different vert inspectors that could, um, you know, have, do the same similar things for different hypervisors, right? But it's just the way it was done initially for libvert, right? But then you've got the case that Julianne mentioned where you've got, say, bare metal involved, right? So you've got um, a bare metal host that's managed by Ironic as if it was an instance. Now, in that case, you've no direct equivalent of a local hypervisor, right? There's no libvert daemon involved. So in that case, I think the agent interaction will be remote necessarily. If, if my understanding is correct. In fact, yeah. uh, I think we, we are trying in the end to remove uh, in compute node agent, right? We would love for Nova Somewhere to be so. automatically generating yeah. the data yeah. without us having to put an agent everywhere. Yeah. I mean, if, if Nova was to emit these notifications with the information we need at the correct cadence and it was a predictable cadence, well then that would obviously make life a lot easier for Salometer. Yeah, yes, so that's correct. generally, like, so, so let me give you an example of where that work might be made a bit simpler, right? So say, for example, you wanted to alarm on the rate of um, disk IOPS, right? Now, currently, what Salometer meters is the cumulative number of um, bytes or disk write requests or read requests or whatever. So that's not uh, really suitable for alarming when you're comparing to a static threshold because you've got a kind of monotonically increasing cumulative value, right? But we have a mechanism, we have a generic transformer that allows you very easily, just via in a declarative way, just by writing some YAML, right, in the, in the pipeline configuration, that allows you to say, okay, this value is being collected currently as a cumulative value. That's not really what I want, or I, I do want that, but I want additionally, I want to be able to work out the rate per second right, an alarm on that. You can, without writing any new code, you can just uh, basically configure that into the system so that um, in addition to the cumulative value, a, a rate per second is also metered and then alarm on that value. So that's kind of a special case where we are collecting data that's related to what you require, we're just not collecting it in the form that's suitable for alarming on, yeah. But if it was something totally new, if it was a, a metric that we're not currently gathering, well then, you can't alarm on it because we just don't have that data. So either you would have to contribute the, the agent to gather it or extend an existing agent or the community would have to do it. But either way, that, that, it, that data would have to somehow be collected by Salometer into the metering store and made available via the API before we'd be able to alarm on it. Is on so I'm sorry, I'm going to have to interrupt you because I think we've run out of time, right? Um, yeah, we've got maybe 28 seconds left. <laughs> so uh, I would like not to impede on the next session. Okay. And uh, maybe we can take additional questions uh, outside of the room uh, in a moment. Thank you very much. Thank you. So